Okay, so while we're setting up, I'll just uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, Jean Borkovac, he's a guy who really likes to play around with iPads and iPhones. Uh, not always and not mostly Angry Birds, but uh, more about uh, their security issues. And currently he works in England as a penetration tester, so he's one of the uh, guys from Hungary who got his luck, and he's our first Hungarian speaker who's actually from a foreign country. And if you're ready, then uh, the floor is yours. Thanks for coming. And the short intro, um, my name is Kovács Jomor. I'm a Hungarian dude. I'm a um, penetration tester by trade, an IT security, IT security geek by title, and a hacker by mentality. And as it was said, I work currently for a major financial institution in London. And uh, what we usually do during the day is we break shit and um, ruin other people's day, and I love this. And um, this particular um, financial institution has embraced the idea of uh, iPads. Who here does have an iPad? Just raise your hand. Come on, higher, it's not a shame. Good. But you're, the, you're the cool guys, you're the lead people. <laughs> so, um, when Apple introduced iPads back in 2010, early 2010, people usually didn't get the idea first. Like, they didn't know what to do with it. And um, iPads were developed with uh, individuals in mind. Like, they were designed to be as desirable as possible and as, as, uh, as nice as possible. So, so that people who actually own such a device, they're going to fall in love with their iPads. I think you guys who have iPads, who raised your hands, can testify that. So, but the scenario has, um, has greatly changed since then, because as of uh, late 2012, which is, I think, now, um, many corporations and many enterprises got the idea. So they they realized that iPads can be used as enterprise devices. They can be used to, to be given to employees to do stuff like corporate things and sending emails and things like that. And um, in order to prove this point, I have a fancy table up there. I hope you, hope you can read the figures. If you look, look at the numbers, so we are talking about the order of 10,000 iPads per corporation. And it's a re quite recent survey. It's been updated uh, quite recently. And if you look at the numbers, like um, Korea Telecom, 32,000 iPads. Just imagine, 32,000, that's a lot. And um, there are some other niche players in this list. Just check out the errors, like US Air Force Air Mobility Command or the Singapore military. Uh, they, they must be serious. Come on, like, uh, I wonder what the military dudes do with their massive camouflaged iPads running around battlefields and checking out Facebook and tweeting and things. So I wonder what they use these things for, but that's just my, <laughs> my idea. So um, now we're talking about a massive amount of uh, corporate iPads. And during this talk, I'm going to use the words iPad and random iOS device quite interchangeably. So when I say iPads, I mean iPods, iPod Touches, iPhones, all practically all handheld Apple devices. So um, they are not niche players. And um, you want to know what, uh, what makes an enterprise iPad an enterprise iPad. I'm going to tell you, it's enterprise data. So when it comes to enterprise iPads, enterprise iOS devices, what is the most important thing in those devices? It's not the hardware. It's not, not the user's emails. It's corporate stuff. If we talk about like financial institutions who use iPads to do sales activity, like sales per salespeople wander around, they distribute iPads to the owing clients and you know, you can imagine if those presentations with numbers like uh, secrets, uh, confidential information, stuff like this get into the wrong hands, then we're talking about a serious issue. So the question is, when we do iOS-related application testing, is can we 
extract stuff? Can we extract corporate data? Can we extract conf corp confidential information from those iPads? And uh, this, of course, involves we have to think differently than what Apple and the developers uh, expect. Um, on a side note, this is a quite old Apple logo with this rainbow Apple thing. I know, uh, I'm pretty sure you remember this. This is way before the I era. And uh, the funny thing is, the logo, the, the, the brand, like the tagline is think different. And this, uh, this is very funny from my point of view, applied to a company which restricts you as a user from installing anything but what has been pre-approved by that company. So think alike. I think that's, that's, that, that's funny. Which brings us very nicely to our next topic, jailbreaking. Who here does have a jailbroken iPad? Just raise your hand. For you guys, I have a picture in the right side. For the rest of the guys, there is some text on the left. <laughs> so uh, jailbreaking means that certain restrictions are removed from the iOS kernel and from the iOS operating system itself. Um, primarily, it's used to remove the necessity to have applications on your device which has been pre-approved by Apple. So if you have a jailbroken iPad, you can install anything on it practically. And um, there is um, there's this, this um, common misconception. So jailbreaking is not the same as installing CDIA. CDIA is, having CDIA installed is like a, uh, like a side effect of the whole thing. It's, a, it's much more like a package manager if you think about Linux terms. The, um, the process itself works the way it uses exploits to, um, I think there are a couple of exploits in the DFU mode, DFU ROMs of these iPhones and iPads. DFU stands for, uh, I think, device firmware upgrade or something similar, but I prefer the term device fuck up mode because this, this mode is like a um, uh, like, um, diagnostical thing, so that's what iTunes uses to, to update stuff and update the operating system. And this is the easiest way to brick an iPad. What, what happens is it basically does uh, is add, it adds a kernel patch, which removes signature checking. And having done that, you can install SSH, GDB, Secrape, blah, 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 kind of other things. Um, I um, highlighted SSH, GDB, and Secrape because I'm going to use those in the demos. Um, so what? <laughs> I mean, what's this fuss about? Uh, the, the main thing is that Jailbreaking is, is, is real. I mean, it's out there. It happens to devices. Even if uh, Apple wants, you tell you other, wants uh, to tell you otherwise. And when it comes to designing corporate applications, handling corporate and sensitive data, this is a serious thing to think about. Because uh, according to my understanding, uh, many people who are in managerial positions and they're like system architects, uh, developers, and the like, they simply overlook the, 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 this option of having a jailbroken device underneath their applications. So when we do penetration testing, we usually use jailbroken iPads, jailbroken iPhones, because they, are, they, they, because they are like the basic toolkit for iOS testing. So performing an iOS test without a jailbroken device is like trying to fix a car without the screwdriver. In order to prove this point, um, to illustrate uh, what, um, what potential an attacker has who has a jailbroken iPad, I have a, um, I have a dummy demo, actually, um, which implements this algorithm. It's pretty straightforward. I don't want to talk about too much. Um, the user enters a password. The application creates a hash of the password and uh, compares this resulting hash with a known good value. And depending on the result of this comparison, we go either to update saying, OK, cool, you're logged in. Otherwise, we do something else. And um, where this known good value comes from, it's, it's actually irrelevant from our point of view. Uh, it can come from the keychain. It can come from uh, 
some configuration files within the file system. If we talk about like an online authentication thing, it even can come from somewhere else on the internet. So it's, um, in this particular application, it's the keychain that stores this. Uh, it's an MD5 hash of the password. So I'm going to show you guys how this thing works. I think, I hope, uh, I have, yes, I have it here. Um, so this is the application, this is the login screen. The password is 1111, it's a very complex one. And here are my uber secret corporate documents here, which I'm going to protect. Uh, I log the device again, see like 4444, try to Type to VNC, it's 4444. Four, four, four. It's it doesn't that mean it pops up the login prompt again. So how can we bypass this? Let's return to our presentation. And the most crucial point of this control flow is this is equal function, which decides whether or not uh, the entered password is good or 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 something else. So if we can somehow tweak this function, uh, we, if we can hijack it, uh, we can um, hack the thing so that it lets us in with any password, so we don't have to know the good one. How can we do this? Um, in this particular example, I don't give you the source code. Uh, I hope you can read it. Um, if you can't, the next slide will be much more readable, so uh, just bear with me. So uh, if we look at what, what's going on, on on the assembly level, this is an actual screenshot from the autopsy provided by, uh, by IDAPRO on my demo application. So this is the real thing, this is what's going on. And uh, this is pretty much uh, what was on the previous um, figure. So you can see this, I have a cursor here. So this is the pin code hash function, which obviously performs a hash of the pin code and the is equal uh, function is invoked afterwards, and what's interesting is, depending on the result of the comparison, we can go to either we ask the pin code again, or we draw the other, the other screen which shows the documents themselves. Um, this is, I think, it's much more easily readable. Um, highlighted, even if, you, if you're not familiar with ARM assembly, I hope you guys, you paid attention to the previous talk because they give you the highlights. They give you the basics. So um, I highlighted the important bits with red. I, I, hope, I hope you can see it. So um, these are the two function calls. Um, the one called pin code hash is equal. And this, um, this instruction here, no, this instruction here, this tst.w is a test uh, instruction. It decides whether or not the R0 register which holds the result of the comparison is true or false, like it's a one or zero, is a yes or no in Objective-C Boolean syntax. And depending on the result of the comparison, we can either go, uh, we can take the branch, the B and E stands for branch if not equal, so it's like jump zero, jump non-zero in IE3, I386 assembly. Um, so how can we bypass this thing. Let's see. Um, we come back to our presentation, to our iPad. Uh, okay, here we go at the pin code screen. And I have a um, SSH client and SSH server installed on my iPad. So I can see what's going on. So first of all, I have to figure out, I'm going to do this from scratch so that you guys can see what's going on and believe what I say. So first of all, I have to find uh, the process ID. Wrap demo, it's 241. Sycrypt, what I'm actually using now, it's, it's um, imagine it like uh, as a, as a, manipulation a runtime manipulation framework for Objective-C applications. It, it's, uh, imagine it like GDB on steroids. So it gives you um, Objective-C-like syntax. You can 
manipulate objects in the memory. Uh, it's, it's a really good thing. I'm, I'm going to use this quite extensively during these demos. So if we come back to the previous screen, um, I did my homework when mapping the application and uh, checking out what's going on. So I know that when the user presses the OK button on the screen, it's this detail view controller alert view will dismiss with button index function. I love objective C syntax. It's, it's very nice. So this function is what gets called. But the main problem is I want to, if, if uh, someone of you, those who did like crack me, uh, know that you kind of get the idea what's going to happen. Um, but the main problem is that iOS applies ASLR, so uh, from a static analysis, you can't tell where this function will reside in the memory, like in which address. That's why we use Cypre. So I'm going to figure that one out. I'm going to have typos. So that's why I use this cheat. So this Cypre thing is, uh, it uses Objective-C reflection so that it can tell you the memory address of each function of each object in the memory, which is a really cool thing. Now, in this, uh, in this one, it's this OX8280D thing. So I attach a GDB debugger to this um, 241. Cool. I set a breakpoint to this address, and so on. on. Um, so, so that you guys can see what's going on. Um, so I type, I don't know, three, 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 go, and we see that the breakpoint is hit. So it's not not a big magic so far. So let's see what's going on. Uh, Dollar PC, as you might recall from the previous talk, is the program counter, which uh, is like EIP in I-86 assembly. And this is, the, this is the standard prologue of every ARM assembly uh, function calls. I did my homework, so if we come back to this uh, assembly screen, um, I'm looking for this particular point in the memory. When the actual com the result of the actual comparison is evaluated. So I did my homework, and I know it's exactly from uh, 62 instructions away from where I stand now. And uh, there we go. This is the one. So if we take a look, closer look, we see that this, this, is, this is it. So this... Um, Window is disassembled by GDB, and this other one on the, on the slide came from IDA Pro. So they kind of match. So we set a, another breakpoint here. Remove the first one. So go on. Cool with there. We see that this is the test.w instruction, which is the next one to be executed. So we, we found our point where we're going to change things. So far, we only like see, uh, we only, well, only what we did, so we um, inspected the memory and stopped the application, but now we're going to intervene. So uh, what's going on is this R0 register is evaluated, so let's see its contents. It's zero, so it's not equal. So what I need to do is simply send all on zero equals one. Remove my breakpoints. Yes, I come back to my iPad, and I see it's going on, and we load in. So what did we do? Um, we mapped the application with IDA Pro, and uh, what we did is run this application in a very um, very hostile environment in a debugger. We touched the debugger, and we uh, pinpointed the exact point where the comparison result is evaluated. If you recall this figure, um, this one, 
this is the point. This is what we tweaked. So we changed one byte from uh, zero to one, and then the application control flow took the other direction. So this is, this is wow, kind of cool, but uh, jailbreaking should be detected because this, is, this, this can be done very easily with any application. So it's, it's trivial from now to bypass um, certificate detection, like anchor-based certificate pinning, uh, when the root certificate or the anchor certificate fingerprint is checked, even though it's a uh, valid certificate, the application will re refuse connecting to that SSL endpoint. So um, applications should prepare for jailbroken devices, but how can they do this? Um, I, I gathered a couple of methods. Uh, the first one um, is the most widespread. I mean, it, it's out there pretty much everywhere. Um, it, what it does is checking for known residual, residual artifacts of the jailbreaking process. So we're looking for stuff like slash war slash log slash cd other log slash war slash ssh slash uh, bin slash su and stuff like this. And in case one of these files exists, it's, it's an evidence that the device is jailbroken and uh, the application can accordingly act accordingly. Um, this is the most widespread and most easy to implement and the most, uh, most compatible because this works in simply all iOS versions. Uh, back in the day, uh, in iOS 3 API, Apple used to have a function which told the application in a programmatic matter, manner uh, whether or not the device is jailbroken or not but that was too easy to hijack. So they simply ditched that function call. So at this point, each and every application has to implement some kind of jailbreak detection by its own, on its own. Um, another option is to do a fork uh, syscall. On a non-jailbroken, like an intact kernel, um, if you call a fork function call, then the the iOS returns a zero, so it, it's, it, the seed belt, the, um, the sandbox doesn't allow you to do forks on your application. Um, that's, that, that's also uh, widely used because it's very easy to implement. Uh, another option is to check the size of the file system tab uh, because in, um, in iOS, in intact iOS versions, the size is well known and static. In, non, in the jailbroken uh, iPads, it's going to be different. Then uh, you can check for um, the number of dynamic libraries which are loaded in the memory and, which, and, and the permissions uh, which they are loaded with. This, 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 is very, this, this is much more getting like voodoo because uh, with newer iOS versions, these parameters change. So if you want to use one of these, um, these methods, you're going to pre have to prepare your application for newer and newer iOS versions, which is a very nice and very popular thing in iOS in amongst the iOS developers. And I left the final, the final one when the application tries to build a TCP connection to localhost 22, which is the SSH port. This is a very stupid thing to do. It's very, very easy to bypass. But it's there anyway, so I, I saw it, I seen it. Um, the main problem is that when an application tries to decide whether or not it runs on a jailbroken device, it's pretty much like uh, when you try to decide whether or not you're in the matrix. Because the matrix controls everything you see, you touch, you feel. So you, you can't decide. And um, you only can do uh, your best to, to decide whether or not you're running on a jailbroken device. But again, this doesn't work in any cases, there's no silver bullet. So this is like a theoretical problem which cannot be solved. Uh, in order to prove this point, uh, I made a very simple kind of dummy jailbreak detection uh, routine, which all it does, uh, even if you're not familiar with iOS and the Objective-C syntax, it's pretty straightforward and easy to see what it does. So um, the keys, um, there are two functions called dirty device and clean device which in this example, they just simply pop up an alert window. And uh, depending on the existence of the slash applications slash cdo.app, um, the application control flow takes one uh, 
branch or the other. So it's, it's not, not, a, not a very uh, big thing. Um, I'll show you guys a couple of things how to bypass this. It's out there. I've seen it in many, many applications. Uh, at this point, I'm talking about like manual bypass. I don't want to use applications which are available from the CD or repo, and they tell you that they, they implement an uh, um, algorithm which hooks into iOS system calls and does this thing kind of automatically for you. I'm, doing, uh, I'm talking about doing everything manually. The first thing is, uh, is like the ECDC of uh, JBRA detection bypass methods. It simply take a hex editor, fire up, fire it up, open the application binary, and overwrite the strings which are looked for. It's dirty, it's very, very ugly, but it works. Um, it's much more interesting if, if we do this in a more intelligent manner because this uh, previous methods, this previous method with the, um, with the hex editing thing, it's obviously going to, to screw the application integrity. So if, in case the app implements some kind of integrity check, then it's going to fail. Uh, so we're going to use a much more intelligent approach. Um, we use GDB. Um, the key point here is to check the existence of the CD or the app application uh, or file. And um, this file exists at path, uh, which is highlighted in red. Uh, that's the API call in iOS, which does the check. Uh, there are a couple of other options where to put our breakpoints. Um, probably we can use this um, function call, th this um, condition check. Uh, similar to the previous example with the test w that's what we're going to do in the demo. Or alternatively, we can hijack the door to device function which gets called when the device is, is, um, is jailbroken. So um, when talking about realistic, like real life applications, such door to device functions can implement like wipe, they can, uh, they can remove themselves, uh, they can't remove themselves, but they can delete everything which the user uh, entered, like if they contain some kind of confidential data, they can probably wipe those. Uh, but that all depends on the application itself. So we're going to, uh, we're going to pinpoint our, um, our breakpoint to this is jailbroken function. Um, I made a small um, figure here, which shows the calling stack. So when we get to the point, where the file exists, the path function is called, that this is the control flow. It's, uh, it's going from down to upward. So uh, before the file exists, a path function is called, um, is the is broken function, which is in the calling stack. And all, before that is the jailbreak detection. So that's nothing really, really fancy here. But this will all make sense in a minute. Um, quit this one. Um, come back to my iPad. This demo application is simply, well, this is an excerpt from the actual source of this app. So it checks whether or not the CD or the app uh, file exists or not. In case it exists, it's, it pops up a jailbroken function. Um, otherwise, otherwise, it's going to show a clean device. So um, let's, let's get back here. Uh, fire up GDB. Okay. We set up a breakpoint at the file exits at path function. Uh, I think I bring it back to you so that you can see what's going on. Um, probably like this. So let's start it. And we already hit the breakpoint. Let's see what's, uh, what, which parameter was it called with. So if you recall the previous talk, in ARM uh, assembly convention, uh, the calling convention, it's the uh, R, R0, R, R1, R2, R3, which hold the uh, parameters for the function calls. And in this particular example, the file is the path function. The, the R2 contains the, uh, the string that contains the file name. 
So it's a, it was because um, when we do is do it in a more sophisticated and bigger app, uh, this function gets called many times, and not only with our JBRA detection routine, but with everything else. So we see that, yeah, this is the real one. We have to find this. So let's see what's in the backtrace. Um, GDB doesn't tell us um, which functions we have here, uh, but if we see, if we look at uh, what's in the calling stack down here and in here, uh, we see that th these are the same. So I'm going to hijack this one, set another breakpoint. We hit that breakpoint, and um, let's see what's in there. We suspect something. Uh, so if you recall the previous example, this TST, the W function, or the instruction, is what um, decides whether or not a condition is true or not. So in this case, um, is the is jailbroken, is the result of the is jailbroken function, which uh, the result of which is holding there. So theoretically, we should be, ha we should have a, or we have a one. So it's, it's logical, it's a Boolean true. So the device is jailbroken. All we need to do is to set our zero to false. Uh, remove my breakpoints. Come back here. And it's, it's a clean device. So it's that easy to bypass. And th th that this was actually uh, a kind of laborious thing to do, but I'm going to show you uh, in a couple of minutes another bypass method, which is much, much more easier to do. So um, coming back to our slides, um, this uh, method, this, this, the key of this uh, jailbra detection thing is this is jailbroken function. So how cool it would be if we could simply replace that function with something else, our own devising. So uh, can it be done? Yes. And the answer here is um, method swizzling. That's a, that's a term used for, for um, runtime manipulation of the framework and the application memory. Um, what it, um, the basics are that Objective-C is a heavily reflective framework. So when you do uh, object function calls in an Objective-C program or an Objective-C application, uh, the way the whole framework processes this system, this, um, this function call relies heavily on the names of the functions. And um, in the memory of, this of every iOS application, there is, a, um, fun there is a, an array which holds the, the actual memory addresses for every application uh, and every object which, which are in the application and each and every function which belong to those, those objects. So how cool it would be if we could simply replace this, we could manipulate the contents of this, uh, this table. And this is exactly what we're going to do now. I'm going to quit this. Clear. Come back. Follow the JBT. Okay. We use Secrypt again. No. no. The JBT. Now, what we need to do is to come back to the code, and I didn't include the actual uh, object names in there, but it's not very important because what I'm going to enter is this line. And what did I just now? I created a new function within the application memory, which 
or what it does, it returns a Boolean false value, and th that's all. And in the first, um, first half of this line, I simply overwrote the isJbroken function within the memory, which is kind of cool, because now if I come back to my application and fire it up again, it should say it's a clean device. And I didn't have to do anything with, with GDB. I didn't have to do any disassembly. I didn't have to set breakpoints for that matter. I didn't have to literally do anything that can be considered laborious or, or work intensive. So what's, what's the point here? Uh, when we talk about an iOS application which implements uh, any kind of um, protection routine, I spoke about uh, certificate checking. I spoke about jailbreak detection. I spoke about um, responding to remote wipe commands, which comes through the Apple push notification service. Uh, they are all implemented with such function calls, which can be very easily hijacked on a jailbroken application, a uh, jailbroken device. So, what uh, what what are the conclusions? First. Do not rely on jailbreak detection uh, for because of these uh, these demos I, gonna, I showed you. Don't rely on the fact on the assumption that an attacker is unable to to deobfuscate the binary or to reverse the application. You uh, I showed you some excerpts from um, IDA Pro and GDB. So it's very easy to to disassemble an iOS binary. It's very easily readable. I think it's much, uh, much easier than like, uh, if you think about C++ on IE386. Um, if we talk about a jailbroken device, practically anything on the device can, uh, is to be considered tainted. Anything uh, is considered untrustworthy. So don't rely on the keychain. Don't rely on security checks. Don't rely on the pin code. Don't rely on anything. Uh, the only solution here is, uh, is to assume that the environment, the actual device and the iOS environment, is hostile. So what we need to do is to implement crypto and use it in a proper fashion. Um, this is one of, the, uh, one of the usual solutions we usually suggest. So i give you a little time to, to, to comprehend it. So uh, the way uh, an application should do, say, encryption routines, um, is to create uh, a complex password, enforce that complex password. When the user enters that password, is boost up an AES key from that password and uh, start decrypting data. Don't check, don't have any data that is stored and check whether or not uh, something is equal with that data, equal to that data. Uh, just start decryption and check whether or not the resulting value of the resulting data is sane or not, whether it, whether it makes sense or not. If it makes sense, the user did it right, he knew the correct password, otherwise uh, the user simply forgot the password or entered it incorrectly. And the whole point of this, 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 looks, com this, this looks fairly complicated to the original example, to the login uh, bypass I showed you earlier. But it, it makes sense because um, on a jailbroken device, there are no secrets. An attacker has access to everything. And not even the application itself is to be trusted. And all you can do is to use crypto properly and to use other methods to raise the bar, raise the bar as high as possible so that um, to make the job of an attacker as, as hard as possible. So uh, that's pretty much what you can do. And this is, my, uh, this is my takeaway message. So don't consider any iOS device trusted when dealing with sensitive corporate data. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I have a couple of references and links up there if you're interested. And I think we have a time for a couple of questions. Do we have? Okay, uh, a couple of questions. Sorry, I, I can't see anything. Sorry, speak up. Speak up. Uh, 
uh, the question was uh, that. Sorry. Yep. Uh, the question the question was that can we consider a jailbroken device worse in any manner uh, than a non jailbroken device? So the question is, I think they're equal. They're just used for different purposes. And um, the fact that you mentioned that uh, any device can be jailbroken pretty much. But now it's not entirely true. Um, so um, if an attacker physically steals an iPad, he has the opportunity to jailbreak it and then do the dirty magic we showed you. So even if uh, the employee did not jailbreak his device himself, the attacker can very easily do that. That's true. Uh, that used to be true. Uh, but now with iOS 5.1.1 and iOS 6, if you have a screen lock, a pin lock implemented, it's set on the device, you can't jailbreak it because you can't access anything. Uh, you can't reboot it to DFU mode because it requires to, to uh, unlock the screen first. And if you, start, if you try to jailbreak with uh, red snow or purple rain, um, iOS 5 or up, i 5 or up, it tells you, I'm sorry, dude, I can't do anything with a, with a, with a pin protected device. So, another question? Three, two, one, cool. Thank you very much. <laughs>